All right, everybody, this is just a bit of a fireside chat as I talk about what what I feel we're getting from Nikon in regards to an interview that they had with DP Review recently. If you're not into a bit of a fireside chat and you're only into hard hitting, fast cutting, flashy music and B-roll action, maybe it's time for you to move on. But uh, if you're wanting to hear my opinion as we rake through some of this latest info and see what's going on in the world of Nikon, I think there's some interesting gems there for those who are interested. This is an interview that DP Review did with some executives from Nikon. I just wanted to talk about two other little bits of information that have arrived on Nikon Rumors. The first one is, and so many people will be excited about this, the CFX Express updates for the D5, the D850 and the D500 will be here by the end of the year. And some might say, well, why you can do XQD already? Absolutely. But what if your XQD card was dropped in the ocean or you'd like to buy some more? Well, it would be better to buy the future product and future proof your purchase and then you can use these cards into the future for longer. So of course you'd like to buy the CF Express. It's not going to make these cameras any faster but it does future proof your purchases. Ultimately will save you some money in the long run. Those firmware updates will be coming in the next month or two before the end of the year. The other one is the fact that uh, a few more specs are dribbling out for the Z6 II and the Z7 II and the fact that people were worrying about this line that said there's going to be 4K 60 at a 1.7 crop. Now I think what they meant there was, what they actually said is there would be a further update coming with a new, a new 4K 60 1.7. Basically what I think we're hearing there is we're going to have more than one version of 4K 60 and this 4K 60 is crop because it's just going to be reading the pixels, it's not going to be doing any other processing and so they'll be able to put the processing towards a higher bit rate or higher quality or raw or internal or whatever. So I see this as a positive, not as a negative. And I still think we may well have 4K 60 in a lower quality version that's full frame. Two bits of interesting news. Let's dive into the article. I think this is a really interesting interview. It's a little bit like the leaked information we got a few months ago sharing with us an internal conversation that Nikon was having. I think that internal conversation was something that they did actually want to have leaked. Well, this feels similar. And the information that came from that leaked conversation turned out to all come to fact. It all came to fruition. And so some will say that this piece is just marketing fluff, but I personally think it is a realistic and honest and open window into Nikon's intentions and plans. What we have here is a company that is fighting for its life. It's very proud, it's very honorable. It's been around over a hundred years and they are wanting to supply to their customers the very best products that they can within their paradigm. Now, what has been distressing for someone like me over the last few years is to listen to influencers, online personalities, talk about a company that really I'm not sure they actually know that much about the real world usage of these tools. And I don't mean grabbing them and taking them for a couple of days for a bit of a spin. I mean having them in their life like a long-term relationship and how it actually works in the reality of the real world. So my concern is people who don't have that relationship with the company and don't have that relationship with the equipment that either brings them great joy or actually brings them their living, they critique, they comment, they create opinion pieces on these companies, on these items, yet they're not really coming from the place that these items are supposed to be used. And this to me has created an unrealistic set of benchmarks and rules. And now Nikon have found themselves in the middle of this influencer firestorm that has engulfed the world in the last few years. Yet I believe they continue to deliver great products, strong products. No company is perfect. 
Every company makes mistakes, that includes Nikon, but they do things at their own speed and they do them at their own speed, but they tend to do them well. Now you'll hear people complaining bitterly about this or that. Now, the reality is that at the end of the day, you might complain about five metrics on a camera, but guess what? There's another somewhere between 200, 200, 200, and 1000 metrics that make up that camera. Personally, I wonder if it's not being too over the top to get 995 things or 195 things right and five things that don't quite meet your needs and so people lose their mind and they say things like fail, disaster. So in this article, what we see is Nikon, the company, they're listening to their customers, they're aware of their shortfallings, they're talking about it, they're talking about the fact that they were not first to market in full frame mirrorless and they're aware of that. They're talking about the fact that at the launch of the Z mount, they were unable to communicate the value of the Z mount and its optical brilliance. They talk about the fact that the lens lineup is now maturing and they're going to be able to move into more exotic lenses. They talk about the fact that they're listening to their customers and they understand the things that they need. So this is a company that's aware, they're doing their very best. They have been hit by various market forces. One of those market forces is called Sony. Another market force is called C19. Both of those massive global entities, one being a company, another being a virus. There are a lot of forces at work some deliberate, some not deliberate. For example, Sony's work is deliberate. They are deliberately trying to take number one spot in the camera market. They are deliberately attacking Nikon and Canon as hard as they can. That is not Nikon's fault. That is Sony's objective. Their objective is to take out Nikon because they've decided to enter the market, to enter this market, the consumer camera market, and shake it as hard as they possibly can. Imagine a thousand pound gorilla at the bottom of the tree, shaking it as hard as that gorilla possibly can. Well, that is Sony in this market since they arrived in the full frame mirrorless in 2013. It's not Nikon's fault. Sure, Nikon could have behaved differently. C19, definitely nothing to do with Nikon. And again, I can hear people saying, oh, Nikon did this, they brought out the Noct and they brought out the Z6 and the Z7 and they weren't there for professionals. Those cameras, in my personal opinion, were never meant to be a replacement for the D5 or the D850 or the D500. As I've said before, there is a four year cycle on these things. The D850 replacement, it's not due until about September 2021. Well, guess which camera we have just found out is rumored to arrive in September, October of 2021. Well, it's a camera that sounds a great deal like a D850 replacement, and that is the Z9. So from my perspective, everybody who's complaining about anything between 2017 and 2020 in regards to not having a flagship camera to take their photographs and get their work done, well, they're not looking at history and they're not looking at reality. And if you think that Nikon would be able to bring a flagship camera to bear for their very first version, was never gonna happen. What they said was, is the Z mount is something extraordinarily special. That's it. Oh, and we're bringing out some cameras. Those statements are separate. They're separate statements. So there's all these conflated joining arguments. Oh, you also hear people say, oh, the price, the price. Well, uh, this is something brand new, first ever. You are going to receive the early adopter tax. That's what you're gonna receive, the early adopter tax if you buy early. Now, the reality is the Z6 was not ridiculously expensive. It fit right in the market where the market was at that point in time with all the other 24 megapixel cameras. So not sure what everybody's talking about there. And don't talk to me about the pro blah, 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 blah. If you were desperate 
to experiment with the new mount, then you take the choice, you take the hit of being an early adopter of that new system. Canon followed exactly the same path and guess what? Sony followed the same path when they launched their first cameras. One slot. So moving on from all of that, this is Nikon, the company. Nikon, the company, is aware of where they fit in the marketplace. They're aware of how they need to pick up speed. They've dropped 16 lenses and two teleconverters in the first two years. And that, so that's eight lenses per year. And they are going to drop another eight lenses next year. That is 24 lenses that is going to really round out the Z system. We're going to see the Z6 II, the Z7 II, that's really going to again round out the bodies and address the majority of concerns. Now, there is going to be a minority of people whose needs and wants are not addressed by these cameras either. And so be it, that's life. The reality is I can look at any, I can look at any camera system. I can look at Sony, I can look at Canon and I can find you features where they don't meet my use case and I'm not happy. So again, <laughs> there is no perfect camera. That is why our good friend at Camera Conspiracies wrote a song all about this. All he wants is a perfect camera. Irony just a dripping off the pancakes of this song. There is no such thing. There is no one camera that will absolutely fit every single person's need and use case. So taking all that stuff into account, Nikon are aware, they're moving forwards, they understand, they're trying to get the job done and they're working very hard into the future. In this article, they talk to us about all sorts of really interesting topics like, for example, what challenges did the company face since January? And of course they talk about COVID and the fact that they could not get their people to the factories in order to, and specifically talking about the 70 to 200, it's, it's January, February, COVID is starting to become a big problem in China and Asia. They've got to finish off these lenses. They're trying to finish off these lenses and they can't get their quality control work done. Obviously some of the lenses were completed because they went out to various, a uh, number of various influences as well as some made it here to Australia. I know Nikon had a copy and they were giving it to some of the retailers to have a look at. So the lenses did exist. But when you've got to bring out 10,000 or 100,000 of them, you need to inspect them all. You need to have a team of people. Now, in this uh, interview here from DP Review, they talked about the fact that the lenses are made in China. Well, my copy of the 70 to 200 is made in Thailand. Interesting. Is that because they had to move it to Thailand because they couldn't do it in China? Or is that because they're making them in multiple places? You let me know if you know the answer to that question. The 70 to 200, I think it's perfectly logical that they were they were basically, they've, they've got the prototype, the beta copies done. They've got early hand inspected by one or two people copies out to the world. And they were just about to start pushing them through quality control in the month of, you know, in the start of March, and they were going to arrive in March, the world broke. Makes sense to me. I don't know why people have got all these other conspiracy theories. I don't think they redesigned the lens like some people talked about. That's just not simply not possible to basically have a product that close to launch and expect that just, just in the space, space of like four or five months, they can re-engineer it. Not, not gonna happen. What products have been most affected by COVID? And it's actually been their high-end cameras. Because photographers have basically stopped working during this period, it's basically meant that uh, they've stopped buying stuff. And this has been a big thing for them. But, but Nikon State right here, and I think it's, Nikon is recovering at a fast pace. We were recently able to bring the Z5 to market as well as two extremely important lenses, the 14 to 24 2.8 and the 50 mil 1.2. While the 70 to 200 has also come to market, Furthermore, the Z7 II and the Z6 II will be joining the lineup soon. These, as well as other items, will be shipping to our customers and retailers, and we are confident 
that their performance will drive additional customers to Nikon. The start of that is Nikon is recovering and at a fast pace, and that's the most important part. Now, I don't think Nikon can make that up because we will see it in the quarterly and annual returns and we can look back. So they're just not in a position as a corporation to make those sort of statements and they simply be not true. So for example, if they've sold just say 10,000 of the new 70 to 200 lenses and they, uh, let's say they make $2,000 off each of those, 10,000 times 2,000 is $20 million. Now let's say it's 100,000, well that's $200 million. So these products that are coming out, the Z5, all of these, the lenses, the 51.2, and as well the, the 14 to 24, these are make, making a massive difference to Nikon's bottom line at the same time as them cutting costs. This is something I talked about a while back, that there's just gonna be, there's a potential for rapid change with success. So here Nikon is talking about what was basically what can we expect and what was the feedback from the Z6 and the Z7 and what can we expect from the new cameras. On, on October 14th you will see that these new cameras have addressed several points with hardware updates. So there's no question in my mind at all that we're going to be getting the dual card slots, the vertical grip, improved autofocus we've got the multiple processes i mean uh, we we basically expect nikon rumors to be solid and well i think this is basically being confirmed here because this is the word several well means two or three or maybe more and um that's really the number of issues that uh, that are ha happening the only other issue that i can think of is a flip out screen and for those who need, want to flip out screen, I think brace yourselves. It may not be there. We might be surprised. It might be the one last thing they've kept under wraps. Don't know why. Again, I think it's about strength and integrity of weather sealing and overall strength is their reason they don't do it. We will see. It may also be that, that, that ultimately the vlogger market is simply something that Nikon is not chasing. And if that's the case, that's fine. I mean, I use their cameras for for vlogging or filming myself all the time and I understand how a frame works and I understand focal width so I know where where my face is in frame and I don't need to see myself to be able to frame and of course in video now you can rely with the mirrorless cameras on them getting your face in focus when you when you need to do that when there's no operator there is nobody running this camera it is just there on their own all of these things come together and make it all work flip out screen might be the only thing that's missing it's confirmed here from my perspective that these hardware advancements are coming so that's super exciting the details we don't know just yet what, what should be the the expectation around the top end camera and they basically say they're not going to comment on it what we can read into this is that there is a flagship camera coming because they want to make sure it's as good as it can be so <laughs> it's definitely coming and again i think the nikon rumors on the z9 make sense it basically sounds like a souped up d850 and we're expecting that next year so all of this stuff makes complete sense that it's going to come next year. What are Nikon expecting for 2021 is it was difficult to show off the optical quality of the Z mount when there was very few lenses. Now they have enough lenses in the range to be able to do that. Also, the, the, the bodies that are coming to market are going to satisfy the needs of photographers and videographers. Now, I'm quite confident, like I'm, I, I think the cameras we have now are fantastic, bringing the extra features that we pretty pretty confident are coming, it is gonna be there for 95% of people. Again, to reiterate, no camera is going to be a, a right for 100% of people. The Z6 has been well received among video enthusiasts and filmmakers, and its successor promises even more. We hope that more video professionals will discover Nikon due to our innovative features for creators. That's interesting to me. They're, 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 what they're basically saying there is they're going to innovate and give us something new. I think they were the first to give us raw video in this sort of camera. So I'm really interested to see what other innovations they might be able to bring when the A7S III is pretty impressive 
and the R5 is pretty impressive, but the, I, they're both going to be far more expensive than the Z6 II. So maybe it's relative to price point, but I think there's something to watch there. They're gonna be working hard at bringing us things we haven't seen before. Obviously they have their relationship with Atomos and the Ninja Raw Video, hmm. regards to the raw firmware update for video that the demand outstripped their expectation. So I, I think that's quite interesting that more people got that upgrade than they thought. Of course, they don't give us numbers. Maybe they thought eight people were gonna get it and 12 did. I don't think that'd be the case. Here, they're talking about what other DX lenses are they going to bring, bring to market? Are they gonna to commit to it? And they touch on the fact that the pancake lenses, the 28, and the 40, so the 40 becomes a 60, and the 28 becomes a, what is that, 40, it becomes a 42. So they're kind of useful lenses. You don't have a super wide there on DX, but you can obviously use the lens that I'm using right now, which is the kit lens on the Z50. It goes right out to 16, so it's a 24. But those lenses will be lovely, and I, I suppose it's almost a 35 and almost a 50. Just, just a bit longer than those two lenses, but I think they're gonna be very small. They're saying that the consumer response to the Z50 has been great and people have really enjoyed the two kit lenses and I think they provide a great deal of bang for buck. Like these lenses are, depending on the deal you might get, they're anywhere between 100 and $150 each. And honestly, <laughs> the optical quality is great. My only concern would be toughness, not optical quality. But if you can keep them in one piece, I think they will look after you and serve you very well for a very long time. They're just not as tough as all metal lenses. They are asked about their APS-C strategy, but when they're asked any direct questions of this type, they always say, we don't discuss products that don't exist yet. Uh, talking about the 50mm 1.2 and why it's such an exciting lens, I'll just read very quickly. This kind of lens is what the Z mount was made for. It's super fast and super sharp. We are very proud of this lens as it is the perfect balance of gorgeous, smooth bokeh and amazing sharpness. And look, that's what I'm expecting from this lens. It's gonna have the optical quality that I'm used to with all of my Z lenses, just sharp as, and then it's also gonna be super creamy if you wanna just shoot it wide open. And then the other thing they talk about here is that it's got two of the STM motors, which is allowing it to have extraordinarily fast focus. And it's also basically removing the issue of focus breathing. And that's something that they're really proud of achieving for videographers. And that's fabulous. And it also gives us a sign. It gives us a sign that Nikon are really interested in being indie film market and every other type of filmmaking area that they can be in. They're trying to get into this space, which is why the comment before about innovating in video, what the hell are they gonna bring us that's new? But they're certainly providing in this lens here an astonishing cine lens that sounds like it's gonna be amazing. So I think out of this, we're getting a lot in the video space, which is really interesting. I mean, we've already seen this, but this is coming out of Nikon themselves. Wow. What is the advantage of the Z mount? And one of the things that I got out of this area here was, for example, now that stabilization can be in the body and doesn't have to be in the lens all the time, obviously they're still putting it in the, in the lens sometimes. It, al it allows them to have more space and so they can design the lenses differently. I really, really love this particular quote here that I've highlighted. Some users will want the ultimate, no compromise, image quality, 
while others will need portability. The Z mount allows for both kinds of lenses. And this comes back to my whole argument around the 1.8 lens versus the Noct. You've basically got a, a, a $500, $500, $600, 50 mil 1.8, which is totally punching above its weight. It's a, an extraordinary lens. And then when you consider the price, it's even more extraordinary. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have the Noct which is about no compromises. If money's no object, which it is no object for some people, you buy it. Simple as that. And you get the best. Simple as that. It's no different to a Bentley or a Chanel something or whatever. And what's going to be interesting about the 50mm 1.2 is it's going to be as almost as uncompromising as the Noct but for what, like a third of the price, they're gonna show us with these three lenses something really amazing and I think it's quite exciting. And I love this and again, I think this is, uh, this is something that's just important for us to all keep in our hearts and our minds when we think about lenses and we wanna complain. Literally both ends of the spectrum that they can, they can provide with this mount. And then to end on this, I think, I think it's really important to end on this part here. When it, comes, when it comes to our decision making, the biggest factor in determining this balance is feedback from our users. Some people might scoff, but I'm super happy that I own four of these new Z Primes and that hasn't cost me uh, an arm and a leg. It's basically cost me almost the same as buying the 70 to 200. And those four Primes I've had a lot of fun with and shot a lot of stuff and they are spectacular. So as I've said it before, I would have, I would way prefer to have bought those four primes, those 1.8 primes, than to have been able to buy, say, one or one and a half of the 1.2. As I'm getting to know the system, getting to understand the system, at, and at no point in time have I ever felt compromised by those lenses. lenses. Yes, designing lenses for the Z mount does give us more freedom. This is an exciting time for optics because the lens mount is wider. We can be more creative with designs and make faster lenses. With in-camera VR, the limitations surrounding VR with wide-angle lenses have been minimized, enabling high-performance AF. Additionally, a crucial mission of ours with the Z-mount system is to consider is the consideration for video. By driving a large focus unit with STM, we are able to drive the focus unit more quietly, accurately, and fast in pursuit of lenses that are also ideal for video Additionally, minimal focus breathing has been achieved. We were careful to design in a way that would give us the most freedom from an optical design standpoint. So today we feel much more able to create, create new types of designs and lenses because of the flexibility of the Z platform. That's what I've been talking about. <laughs> for the last two years. What is the benefit of the new optical construction with a large rear element? There is no need to forcibly bend light to get onto the sensor. Other companies, on the other hand, with small amounts, do need to forcibly bend light, which can reduce image quality. Additionally, with the, with the short flange back distance, we are able to reduce lens size while further contributing to performance. So it's interesting, they're talking about making smaller lenses and, and you know, it's quite interesting that all of those primes are not smaller, they're bigger. Yet an example of where this is true is with the 14 to 24, the 14 to 24 Z is 35% smaller than the uh, F mount version. So that's an example of it working, what the primes are, what these primes are doing. Well, this does sort of segue into my crazy idea kind of semi-crazy idea that might have something to do with a medium format sensor because these lenses are, are all so big, which is contrary to what they're saying there. So either we're, uh, we're being taken for a ride with these particular prime lenses or there is something going on there. We will find out. So yeah, look, I my summation of all of this is, is that Nikon are listening, they're working hard, they're doing the Nikon thing, which is trying to make the quality as good as they possibly can. And if it takes a little bit longer, so be it. I think uh, working with Nikon's a little bit like working with Apple. They get things out when they get them out. They don't talk about it very much until they do. It's not always exactly what we want. It's not always exactly what everybody wants. But one thing that you can rely upon is what they do give you will work. So you might not get all the features you want, but the features that you get, they will work and they will work well. 
and they will work reliably and they will never let you down. Uh, and that's very common with Apple as well. A lot of people complain about the things that Apple do, but what they do when they do give you something and they and you get it, it works. Just might not be everything that you wanted. Well, I feel like Nikon fit in that same space. And they've got some terrifically serious headwinds at the moment with Canon reaching for the stars, Sony reaching for the stars, and obviously the COVID crisis, along with the fact that the photography bubble that so many people have ridden through for the last 10, 15 years, it's closing back down and retracting back down to 1990 era sized industry. And so all of these companies are having to adjust for that market correction. There are a lot of headwinds for Nikon. That's four major headwinds and they are navigating them, I think, quite well. And we are going to see some very exciting products in the Z6 II and the Z7 II. It's been so good to see you. I'd love to know your thoughts about any of that stuff. Please let me know in the comments below. If this is your first time here, it is so very lovely to meet you and I'd love to see you again. So please subscribe, please share, please like, oh, and I'll see you very soon.